Pause, stop recording. Okay, cool. We're recorded. All right. Uh, with a class this size, it's not a big deal. But what I noticed in my bio class was there was a ton of feedback. So if you want to hit mute when you're not asking questions, I could actually hear my voice like repeated to me because I was hearing other people's computer speakers with feedback. Uh, your guys' class, not a huge deal, but just uh, as, a, as a neat aside. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. And then Anna, you're right on time. So put away all your worksheets, notes, and labeling, and we're going to do a review just like we would do a review in class. And uh, you can just, I guess, raise your hand or give me a thumbs up and I'll call on you and uh, we'll do a quick review. So let's go ahead and start with that. Uh, share the screen. Desktop. Yes, please. Okay. You see my screen? Yep. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Let's start here. Uh, nope. I don't want to start there. I want to start here. Yay. Okay. Let's take a look at this stomach. Um, who can tell me what this tube A is? Go ahead and raise your hand if you can. Or give me a thumbs up or something like that. Uh, I see Wink's thumb. Wink, what's A? The esophagus. Got it. Okay. Uh, B is a ring of muscle. Thumbs up if you think you can name B. No worksheets, no notes. Just off the top of your head. It's the key to the fastest hot dog shooter in the Northwest. Starts with an L. Uh, uh, Juliana, give a guess. Is it the lower esophageal sphincter? Perfect. You got it. Okay. D is a region, kind of this area right here. Anybody want to throw out a guess for D? Top of the stomach. It's close to an organ that pumps the blood through your body. It starts with a C. And rhymes with schmardiac region. <laughs> yes, cardiac go region. Juliana. <laughs> is it the cardiac region? It is the cardiac region. That's a great <laughs> guess. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, how about C, this large, expandable upper part of your stomach? Um, anybody want to throw out a guess for that one? Don't wait. It's called the fundus or the fundic region. E is just the big part of the organ. What do we call that? The stomach. The stomach or the body of the stomach. Absolutely. AC, which is so dumb. Like, honestly, why did you not call this FG? Whatever. What? Okay. <laughs> AC. I didn't make this I <laughs> from Google. The bottom of your stomach is called what? Juliana. Is it the pyloric region? Got it. Okay, which makes this ring of muscle AD right here would be what sphincter? The pyloric. Pyloric sphincter, exactly. Okay. Um, AB, dumb lettering, but whatever, is referring to the folds that allows your stomach to contract and expand. What are those folds called? Rugae. Rugae. Got it. And then AE is the first part of your small intestine, and what is that called? Duodenum. Duodenum. Duodenum or the duodenum. You got it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so then next, let's go ahead and go to this guy. You can actually grab this or girl. I don't know. This person. Oh. <laughs> go ahead and grab this worksheet. Hopefully you printed that off or you can even type it in your uh, computer if you want to. Uh, however you want to do it. But this is a, a pretty straightforward diagram, but it's a lot nicer than the games we played. I made mention we'd fill that out next time. Give you guys a minute to get that stuff ready. And actually, while you're grabbing that, uh, you probably read my email. If not, uh, you will soon. Uh, I was kind of waffling back and forth about how to do this test this week. And uh, what I decided to do was to kind of go back to our old way of taking tests. But basically, I've just taken the test I would give you anyway, and I put it as an Edmodo quiz, okay? Uh, you're going to have one of your parents – proctor your exam so this one's going to be no open note you know closed note closed book that kind of stuff mom or dad sits by you and basically verifies that you're just using your brain and you're not googling the answers you go through and take the test like normal and then your last question of the test is your parents verifying that yes they took this test with nothing to help them and, and i was here the whole time and that's how we're gonna do our our next test which i'm planning on this friday so just so you can kind of plan ahead. The digestive is not a very uh, long chapter, but I think that's going to solve some of our problems. I just, I don't know. It was kind of a weird thing. Our test last time, I didn't feel great about it. And uh, some of our test answers were, I ran them all through plagiarism checkers and some of them came back a little 
closer than I'm really comfortable with. So, and so I was just, uh, thought it would be a little bit better to, uh, do it just like you guys normally have it, you know, get this diagram, get multiple choice questions and just do it without the internet. And that's going to be a whole lot better. Uh, so do you have any questions about the test format for Friday? Go once, going twice. Okay. Don't make your parents change their work schedules or stress out over this. The test will be open Friday morning through like Sunday evening. So whatever works with your family's work schedule, um, then, then, you know, they can come supervise it then. Okay. Everybody ready to do this diagram? Hi, John Dobbs. Welcome to class, by the way. I am alive. It's hey. a pleasure to see you, sir. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, anyways, let's go straight to this. Uh, a. A is the parotid salivary gland. Um, I'm not sure if I could write that very well, but parotid salivary gland is P-A-R. You can type it on the thing. O-T-I-D. Type it here. Oh, I'd have to do a text box, wouldn't I? No, you, you go up to uh, view options or annotate something like that. It's it's on it's on um Zoom. It's not on Word. Oh, I got gotcha. you. You got the top you. thing. You can go to annotate, and then it'll um it'll let you like type on the. Give thing. me an option. I got gotcha. you. I understand. Okay. Speaking of, are you guys allowed to annotate on this? Because I tried to change that ability for you to annotate. Because I had biology uh, kids drawing houses on my notes last time. And so I tried I can't to get rid of that, which was kind of funny. So I think I might have actually lost my ability to annotate as well. Um, <laughs> did I? Let's see. I think I might have. Uh, that's okay. I can do it in the Word document, so it's not a big deal. Um, but anyways, parotid salivary gland is P-A-R-O-T-I-D for a parotid salivary gland. Um, B is obviously what? Your tongue. The tongue, exactly. Okay, C. Let's go insert text box. I can type it in. No big deal. Okay. C is a tough one. It is called a sublingual salivary gland because it's below her tongue. Like that. Sublingual salivary gland. Um, if, you know, if you were to put submandibular it's tough because those two are lined up very closely, but sublingual, because it's got these two lines going up to its, the tongue, I would vote sublingual pretty confidently on C. Let me know if I'm going too fast, by the way. Uh, D is obviously what? Esophagus. Got it. Esophagus. And here's how you spell it. I'm sure you guys can probably spell esophagus, but if you can't, that's how you spell it. Esophagus. Okay. Again, the lettering is, is very silly, but E would be what? It's a ring right here where the esophagus meets the stomach. Uh, L E S. You got it. Lower esophageal sphincter. That's exactly right. The lower esophageal sphincter. This pace okay for you guys? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Okay. B-E. I'm probably not going to type this one out. What is B-E? Stomach. Definitely the stomach. Good, good guess. Yes. <laughs> That's the stomach. And then A, B is obviously what? This giant organ? Liver. 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 Easy. Okay. A, C is the gallbladder. It's kind of tough because it's tucked up under that liver. Not bloater. Ladder. Gallbladder is A, C. <laughs> that little guy right there. C D is anybody want to guess? Is that the pancreas? Good guess. Pancreas.
All right. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to jump. We're going to kind of do this in order. We have the small intestine right here and the small intestine right here. Okay. So this is going to be the middle of the small intestine. And this is going to be more towards the end of the small intestine. So jump down to A, B, C. A, B, C is a very, very weird word called the jejunum. <laughs> and that is the middle of your small intestine. And it travels through the jejunum forever until it gets to the ilium. And like we mentioned in previous notes, there's really not like a barrier. Like you are now entering the ilium. Like you don't really know. It's just the end of it's called the ilium. So down here at BD, we'll go ahead and throw in the ilium. So that's the jejunum in the ilium. Feel okay about those? Yep. All right, cool. So stomach to duodenum, duodenum to jejunum, wiggles all the way through jejunum to ilium, wiggles through ilium to the first part of our large intestine. Now, these guys here are probably looking for, uh, you know, the terms for the bumps and the line, which is like Historia and Tinea coli. We're not really doing that. As long as you know that the first part of your large intestine is called the cecum, and then it's the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon. Uh, that's kind of what I'm more interested in. So for AE, which is right here, let's go ahead and call that the cecum. The cecum is the very first part of your large intestine, or yeah, the very first part in the order of the way food is going when it's being digested. Uh, from the small intestine, it goes from the ileum to the cecum, and the best way to remember this is that there is a valve called the ileocecal valve, and uh, that separates the small intestine from the large intestine. So ileum to cecum, ileocecal valve, and that's a really easy way to do this. Uh, so do another text box here. Does anybody want to make a guess? Hey, where'd my text box go? What happened? There we go. All right. Does anybody want to make a guess at what BC might be? It is a little bag. Is, is it your appendix? It is your appendix. Yes. BC appendix. A P P E N D I X. Okay. A D right here is your ascending colon. Ascending colon is, of course, climbing up, moving up. That's A S C E N D I N G. Ascending colon. Yeah which makes CE your transverse colon. And then DE, your descending colon. And if you want to call these ascending large intestine, Transverse large intestine, descending large intestine, uh, it won't bother me at all. The words large intestine and colon are pretty much used uh, interchangeably, so that's fine. And then this little part where it makes this curve is called sigmoid. And then the straight portion is called the rectum. And then the muscular ring that keeps feces inside is called the anus. And so that can be kind of a tricky one. But this is uh, the rectum, not the anus. You can't see the anus from this view because this is the hollow tube inside. That's called the rectum, R-E-C-T-U-M. And that's the end. So does anybody have any questions about this? What was that last little section with the curve called? This guy right here is sigmoid. S-I-G-M-O-I-D. Yeah. You could draw an arrow in there. I normally don't ask folks about sigmoid because it can be tricky. Like, uh, is, this is this arrow pointing to sigmoid 
or rectum because they're so close together. So I generally just say, if you get, you know, the descending to rectum, that's, that's probably fine. Uh, this is clockwise is, is the direction this is going facing the patient. Um, so that's a, an interesting thing to note, I guess. So questions about any of these organs? No. Okay, cool. Well, let's jump back to notes then. Our plan is to pretty much go through uh, lecture uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, review Thursday, test Friday. Um, I don't plan on doing a live review. I'll just post the Jeopardy, post the Quizlets and let you budget your half hour time for review unless you want me to be here for a live review. It doesn't bother me. I'm happy to be on here, but uh, you don't really need me clicking through the Jeopardy uh, in half an hour because I know you can do it quicker and at your own schedule. So uh, let me know. Don't be shy. If you, if you want me to be here for a review day, I can certainly be here. Uh, so anyways, you ready to go to liver physiology? It's a tough one. The liver is, is downright magical. It can do so many things. It's crazy. Uh, so one of the things that the liver can do is it stores glycogen for you. Hello. And this glycogen is your long-term energy storage. So you have breakfast, which is normally some sort of carbohydrate, like cereal, bagel, toast, you know, those are all carbs, right? Uh, so there's a lot of glucose in your blood when you digest those carbs into their little bitty sugars. And you want to store that for later if you need that energy later. So what you do is you take that glucose and you turn it into glycogen and store those carbs for later then that stays in your liver. And when you skip a meal or skip multiple meals, uh, glucose is the fuel that runs your cells. That's how you make ATP. That's how we keep neurons firing. That's how we keep muscles working. And so you skip lunch and, and you skip dinner and your blood sugar starts to tank and you feel faint because you need more sugar in your blood. Your liver will turn that glycogen into glucose and will allow you to have a higher blood sugar and more energy and you'll be in better shape that way. Uh, does that kind of make sense? A little bit? Okay, cool. So in a normal person, uh, that this is how it works. You eat, glucose spikes, uh, you turn it into glycogen, glucose drops, uh, you eat again, you store more glycogen. If you don't eat, you break the glycogen down into glucose and then you have more energy. Uh, the disease where you cannot effectively regulate this is called what? Jacob okay. McIntyre. So the liver uh, makes the glycogen from the glucose or does it do the other? It does both. It breaks down. It does both. It breaks down glycogen into glucose, but it stores glycogen. Yep. Yep. Anyways, I can Anyways, only see... I can only like seven people so i gotta scan over here to see two more of you does anybody know the disorder when you have a difficult time storing your glucose as glycogen or recovering that glucose into your cells diabetes diabetes, diabetes. yes the diabetes you got it that's a good guess uh yeah absolutely so there's a couple of different reasons that people can be diabetic and we'll watch videos on those probably uh tomorrow because I'm afraid that we only have 10 minutes left. But um, yeah, essentially, you, you can have uh, free glucose in your body that's not being taken and stored into cells. And your blood sugar can go very, very high, uh, which, is, which is a bad thing, uh, because you have so much sugar in your blood, but it's not effectively being absorbed by cells. So they're not really getting it for energy. Uh, but that's a whole different discussion. So uh, that's liver functions there. The next thing, oh no, that's not nice. I got to be careful with my lines here. <laughs> Converts non-carbohydrates to glucose. Uh, this is a very, very cool thing. So a glucose is a carbohydrate, right? It has a carbon backbone with a bunch of hydrogens coming off of it. So your liver can take a non-carbohydrate like a fat or a lipid and turn it into glucose. Uh, so when you see people going on like no carb diets, low carb diets, paleo diets, these kinds of things. Uh, the logic behind this, which, which isn't actually that bad, honestly, uh, is that if you're overweight, you have a lot of subcutaneous fat, right? There's a lot of fat on your body that you want to get rid of. So if you starve yourself of carbs, you don't eat any breads, grains, sugars, I mean, nothing. It either comes from a plant from the ground, which can still be carbs, or you cut it off an animal and that's all you're going to eat your body is going to be starved for glucose, but your liver can take fat, oil, 
and turn it into sugar, which is crazy because those are two completely different types of biological molecules, but it can do that, which is awesome. So the idea is if I starve myself of carbs, my body will take the fat it can get. And if I'm a heavy person, I've got abundant subcutaneous fat, take that fat out of my body, put it in my liver, turn it into glucose to keep my cells running. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, cool. So if you hear people who are on keto diets or no carb diets or paleo diets, uh, that's, that's the logic there. And it does work actually reasonably well. So any questions about that? Doing okay about it? Cool. Cut me off whenever you need to. Uh, wink. Oh, it does work, but is it like good for your liver to do that? Or does it really matter? Oh, that's a tough question, right? It's like a balance. Like, is this hard on my liver uh, compared to being overweight and how hard that is on my heart and blood pressure? You know, uh, that's a tough balance. Uh, there are dangers to it for sure. There's a thing called, let me think here, ketoacidosis. And basically you eat so many proteins and you are breaking apart your fats so much with no carbs that when you're breaking apart these fats, you produce these free ketones and you can monitor how many ketones you're breaking down in your urine essentially which is which is pretty amazing because they send that home with the person like uh like peeing on a pregnancy checker stick they pee on it to see how many ketones are coming out in their urine uh which is cool because it lets you know if it's working but too many ketones can actually make your blood acidic because it takes a while to metabolize those ketones out of there. Uh, so people who do like crash diets and are no carbs at all, and they're losing weight super fast, uh, if you can have too much of a good thing, and that can actually be dangerous and change your blood pH. So yeah, I guess, uh, you know, lose, lose weight slowly and sustainably. I don't know, you guys are young and, and you can eat whatever you want and you're fine. So uh, I guess just bear that in mind for, for later or whatever. I don't know, go for a jog, eat what you want, go for a jog, I don't know. Anyways, uh, some other things. Oh, sorry, other questions? I saw a hand up, but then I'm trying to see much screen too. Okay, perfect. Uh, oxidizing fatty acids uh, basically means it can break down fats as well, which shouldn't surprise you. I don't care that you necessarily memorize that uh, because we've already talked about the non-carbs to glucose thing. Okay, so again, what can't your liver make? I don't know. Uh, lipoproteins is a protein connected to a fat. Again, not something you have to memorize. Just get the big picture that your liver can make just about anything you're short on, which is really cool. Your liver can make phospholipids. These are what make up cell membranes and your liver can make cholesterol. Cholesterol gets a really bad uh, reputation in America because we think high cholesterol is a very bad thing. Uh, there's two types of cholesterol. Again, don't memorize it necessarily, but there's HDLs and LDLs, which is high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. And I might get this wrong, but I'm gonna go for it. High density lipoproteins, I think, are taking fats out of your bloodstream and getting rid of them. And low density lipoproteins are putting fats in your bloodstream and causing problems with your arteries. And you can fact check me on Google, I might have those two flipped, but just get the idea that not all cholesterol is created equal and you do need cholesterol, it's an important no. steroid, okay? I don't even know. I don't even know either, okay. Hey kids. Okay, I'm done in four minutes. My kiddos are here. All right, uh, let's see. Some other things. Let's say you go on the no-fat diet, and instead of cutting carbs, you're going to cut all of the fats out of your diet. That can be a popular thing, too. Uh, the cool thing about this is if you go on a diet with no fats, your body can literally make fats. Hey, can you go play, please? I got to finish. I got to finish class. So you go play, okay? Thank you, kiddos. All right, if you cut all the fats out of your diet, your body can make its own fats by changing proteins into fats, which is crazy, crazy cool, or changing carbs into fats. So I'm not trying to say you can eat whatever you want and make what you need, but basically like, yeah, you can almost do that. Your liver is incredible and it downright works magic because it can make whatever you need. Uh, the other things that your uh, liver will do was form urea. Uh, urea is the... Let's, let's think this through. Okay, the end of a protein has a group called NH3 on it, right? You eat proteins, you break apart the proteins, and off comes the NH3. And for the chemistry nerds in the room, that's called ammonia, and that's not okay to have in your body. Right, Sam? Is it okay to have ammonia? You wanna say hi to my class? Say hi, guys. Hi. Okay, 
Okay. Say it's not okay to have ammonia in your body. What's ammonia? Exactly. Okay, so ammonia, the stuff you use to clean your <laughs> toilet, uh, cannot be in your body. That's not okay. So we can get that ammonia and stabilize it as urea. Now, urea is still not good to have in your body, but it is like 100 times safer than ammonia. And we will uh, consolidate that urea in the form of urine, and we will excrete that through the urinary bladder, uh, which is like next chapter, uh, which is a very short chapter as well. So urea is a safe way to store ammonia, and uh, that's, that's a very important thing to bear in mind as well. All right, urea, let's see. Uh, we can change amino acids into other amino acids. So whatever you're short in, you can manufacture, which is very cool. Not all animal or plant protein sources have complete amino acids. There's, I think, 20, maybe 22 amino acids that make up all the proteins that you need. And so if you're eating, uh, your primary food source has, you know, 18 of the 20, you can actually make the amino acids you're short in, which is pretty cool. Uh, storing glycogen, we already talked about. That's not new. You guys know the liver stores glycogen. Uh, there's also vitamins, uh, A, D, B12, iron, and blood. I'm not a big fan of eating liver, like, you know, from animals, beef liver, deer liver, you can buy this stuff. It's not my favorite food, probably not yours either, but there are a ton of vitamins in liver. Like that stuff is downright good for you. It's, it's nature's multivitamin uh, if you can stomach it with enough onions, but liver is generally not that delicious. Uh, so that's an important thing to think about. There is blood in your liver. Obviously we already talked about it filtering your blood. So it gets a ton of your blood supply. And then to put iron separate from blood, it, well, yeah, blood has iron and hemoglobin, so there's a lot of iron in there. Sure, that's fine too. Uh, so we're, we're in pretty good shape there. Okay, uh, your red blood cells are digested in your liver as well. Uh, you already knew that though, because in the cardiovascular chapter, we talked about biliverdin, bilirubin, you know, the yellow skin on, on new kiddos sometimes with that liver that's just kind of starting to, starting to get up to full speed. And so that's an important thing to bear in mind too. And, uh, and foreign substances. So anything that uh, needs to be filtered out can be filtered out. Hey, Eden, you and Sam need to go. You can't be in here. Thank you. All right, uh, removing toxins from your blood. People know that the liver's the filter and that livers can become inflamed and infected and that, you know, that uh, people who drink too much can destroy their liver, that kind of stuff. So that's probably not new uh, for you guys either as far as that's like, I, I would consider that almost everyday knowledge, right? The liver is a filter. Uh, people who take a lot of, you know, things that are hard on their liver, whether that be alcohol or, or illegal drugs or whatever, uh, it tends to destroy their liver and uh, they can get uh, all sorts of damage from that. So uh, with that, we're at about 1030. Um, I think we're probably gonna stop here. Do you have questions about liver, liver functions or any of the labeling we did today? No? No. Okay, cool. Okay, questions cool. about the review, the test, anything at all? Going once, going twice? Okay, cool. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll do 9 a.m. tomorrow, okay? Uh, I'm going to set that up. I hope this works. I think it'll work. I'm going to set that up as a recurring meeting. So the same link will get you into anatomy class every single day at 9. And uh, I'm going to post this recording to Edmodo, and uh, we're done. Cool? Cool. All right. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank Have you. an awesome day. And uh, see you tomorrow at 9. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know. Thank you.